yeah. It's all about the Benjamins, baby. Uh. Uh-huh, yeah. It's all about the Benjamins, baby. Uh. Now. So it's cozy next to another. Yeah, yeah. We can just be go. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, everyone. We've got um, Peter van der Doos from uh, Adjin here, co-founder and CEO. Peter, you want to you kick off with a few slides, don't you, to uh, explain your, your latest innovation? Yeah, that's what I'd love to do. Thank you. Um, let me say a few words about Adjin, and I'm announcing a new product that we have. Um, I think this slide, I always find a little bit humbling that when we set off nine years ago, we founded this company with people from the industry, and we thought we could do things which would be really liked by large companies. So we did the opposite of what you usually do. We didn't start with small customers, but we started with large customers. And uh, there are so many payments companies always that I find it uh, um, a welcoming thought that all of you have used Adyen without knowing it, because whether you use Netflix, Uber, uh, Spotify. It's very difficult to not to be here and not have paid using our system once in your life. Um, a little bit about the journey that we made as Adyen. Started nine years ago, and we thought we were going to make a significant impact on payments. And what we did is we helped customers to sell globally. And one of the one of the steps that we made to make that easier is we implemented all the local payment methods. And we implemented them in a different way. We said we should be connected directly to each payment method. So that means directly to Visa, directly to MasterCard, directly to local methods, whether it's Boleto Bancario in Brazil or whether it's a home banking method in Scandinavia. So if you look at the global growth that we give companies, is we help them, you connect to Adyen, and you can sell all over the world. And if it would be a supermarket, it is like we're buying directly from the farmer. So we don't connect hub over hub, but we believe through one platform. Then we developed and we started doing this about three years ago. We said omnichannel is a demand which a large part of our customers really have. And that's about being able to pay, to pay in store, to pay on a tablet, to pay online, all in one system, because merchants want to recognize their shoppers over all systems. You want to be able to do returns in store very easily. Um, so that's the second layer, that's the omni-channel growth. Uh, you see that's really picking up. You saw a company, uh, a Square, announcing that they're also going to online payments just uh, for mobile, because the omni-channel is so important. Um, then what? We have done this, and that's the third layer which we now add to it, is we have looked at, given all the knowledge that we have and all the data that we have, how can we help merchants further than just omni-channel and just the payment methods of the globe? Um, what you see in payments, I don't think this, yeah, and there we go, um, is that there is something hugely frustrating about buying online, so whether it's mobile or browser-based, and that is that we all experience that sometimes it just doesn't work. You know you have a valid card, and still it doesn't work. And what is that? And here you see a graphic, and also for a merchant, that's a bit of a black box. You have a valid shopper, and he doesn't get through. In a store, you're usually successful in paying. Online, on average, 85% of the shoppers are successful, 15% fail. That's a huge amount. And the merch is, of course, interested in what represents that 15%. That 15% is roughly 10% people who have insufficient funds or people who are just trying and uh, putting in random numbers. But there's 5% valid shoppers that do not get through the payment system. And what we have done is we have developed a product for it. It's called Revenue Accelerate, and we have developed this product to analyze the data and to see what we can do to get that 5% to 0%. So what we want to do is harvest uh, that part. 
Forrest has done research into it, and they say we can get one point, over 1.4% 1 additional revenue by doing this. If you look at what we do, I'm having trouble with this. Um, this product, which I'm launching here, Revenue Accelerate, what we do is we look at several aspects of a payment. And by uh, doing, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a sheet of tools, automated tools, by enabling these for the merchant, we are reducing that 5% loss to now uh, significantly below 4%. There are a few things which you sort of feel that they are th that they are the case, and that is, you know that you're working with card issuers around the world. Are those card issuers all fully up to date? Have they implemented according to the latest spec of Visa, Mastercard? Probably not. If you know how to submit a transaction to the company that gave the consumer the credit card, you can raise it. We call it smart issuer logic. If you know on which networks they are. If a card is double branded with a local network, say in France, uh, a carte bancaire or a visa, can you get an uplift in if you route it over, uh, over one of the, of the dual brands? Um, we know that. There's a protocol, for example, if you take an Uber, Uber tests if your card is valid. This is a protocol rolled out over the world. Every, every card issuer, every company that gave the consumer the credit card should have implemented. In practice, they don't. So we have seen certain countries where only 40% of the cards through this protocol, it's called zero dollar auth, were authorized. If we then change it to a one dollar auth and then canceled it, the 40% moves to 80%. So this is so the, 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 the summary of this product is a whole set of things that we do to help the merchant to get that 5% frustrated, unnecessary loss of transactions to reduce that. Uh, well, ultimately, we are aiming for 0% uh, for loss in that bucket, and that's our target for the next years. Great. So Peter, talk to me a little bit about, I suppose, what do the merchants have to do? Is, is there much? need for them to upgrade any systems or uh, take any action themselves? No, what we have done is we have done this in the background. So before launching it today, we have been, uh, we've been developing this product. And with a few of our large merchants, we have openly looked at, look, this is what we're uh, now activating here. And then typically your question is like, OK, so tell me in which cases I should not use this a validation protocol called zero dollar auth, uh, but should submit one. And then we say, no, you don't have need to do anything. This is an automated system. So we know in which exception cases you need to send in a one dollar auth and then cancel it. And then we also do the cancellation. So you don't need to do anything. It's done for you. OK, so that's all built in. And you said you know, 1.4% of that, of that 5% uh, can be recouped currently. So what's your target? C can that number be raised? Can, you, can merchants? Um, get more revenue back? Well, you see, for example, on this list, auto-retries. We don't, of course, auto-retry any transaction. You auto-retry when there is a system. The assumption that systems are have always 100% uptime is wrong. If you're dealing with the world, worldwide customer base, you know that sometimes something is down. Mm -hmm. So we retry if there is, for example, a system is not there, so you get a system error. But those systems will never be 100% up. So there always will be, if there's a maintenance window of 10 minutes, then of course that's too long for the consumer to wait. If it's a glitch, then a retry can really help. Right. So no, you'll never get to 5%. Um, this 1.4%, I think we're really proud of that we got there. And uh, that is the point where we, feel, uh, uh, where we feel strong enough to launch it. Uh, but we'll continue to work on this, and we will be able to drive it further down. And you've been piloting this with your, with your merchants for yeah. a few months now. Uh, you've got clients from Facebook and, like you said, Netflix, Uber, Spotify. What's the, been the reception from them uh, on the back of this? I mean, 1.4% as a, as a percentage seems quite a small number, but for companies like this, can it, no, is it significant? This is, no, this is huge because you're talking about the payments department tends to be a department which costs money. Mm. And if the payments department suddenly is a department that actually can increase revenue, um, 
in the in in the world of payments, we're talking about a few base points cost, mm. and suddenly you get above a hundred base points additional uh, revenue. Wow, that's uh, uh, that really moves the needle. Uh, and you're playing in a in a super competitive space as well at the moment. You know, you've got competitors from Stripe, for example, over in the states. I mean, how defendable is this product against you know what's stopping uh, Stripe coming out with with a similar? kind of product, so well, why is yours going to stick and, and kind of be ahead? Yeah, what is really good is that we, uh, we have a lot of merchants which have scale, we have a lot of their volume, and they're able to test us, and they're able to, do, uh, to see the provider where they came from, and what we're doing for them, and what we see time after time after time is that they first try us in a certain region, and they say like, wow, this is outperforming, and then you get all volume. So. Um, Making the claim is one thing, but delivering upon it, uh, we see we outperform. And it's a permanent investment. We have a large development team, we have, we have a large group of data analysts to make sure that we stay ahead in the game. But it's not static, right? It's always the next, uh, the next thing to help the merchant. And I, and I mentioned you know, some of your, your competitors there, and the space you're playing in is very, very um, hot right now. So how do you manage to differentiate? What, what are you kind of claiming that can set you apart from what's it's becoming a quite crowded area. If you have international business or if you have omni-channel business, then the list of companies that can really service you is very, very short. And uh, the ones with, uh, um, if you're looking at conversion, then you know that uh, you're in a safe place with us. Okay. Um, I just want to move, move on a little bit. Last year you received uh, some funding from a, from a pretty interesting uh, source, Iconic Capital, which uh, manages funds from the likes of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Facebook CEO, and um, what, what was that like? Uh, and since then, what have you done with that money? What's been the focus and, and that whole experience? We have many companies from si Silicon Valley being our customers. And if you looked at our investor base, it was London, n uh, New York, and uh, Singapore. And we felt a little bit uh, um, that there was something lacking there. So definitely in that transaction, if Iconic wants to invest in you, you just don't say no. Especially if the people who, who, whose funds they are managing are also your customer. Uh, and they have delivered on that promise. Uh, Iconic is a very, very well, I mean, I rate all our investors, but that, that Silicon Valley uh, base of, uh, of Iconic uh, has helped us. They are very active, they are very well connected. So, now, uh, given the connections, uh, have you uh, managed to acquire more, more customers this way, kind of through, through their links to, to some of the most powerful companies? Um, it's never, at the end, in our space, we're so well known that it's not that we don't get a foot in the door and that we're looking for someone's telephone number. Mm. Uh, but indirectly, yes, it gives you the stamp of uh, approved by Iconic. Yeah. And uh, wh how do you anticipate this year going? Are you going to need to raise some more money this year and, uh, for, for any, any reasons? Unlikely. We've been profitable since 2011. I think it's good advice to any payments company try to raise when you're profitable mm. because you are, uh, are coming at it at a position from strength and not from need to have. Um, that's what we have always uh, been able to do. Uh, but we had the luxury position. We came from the industry, and we knew uh, uh, we knew how to make money in this industry. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, Square go public. Uh, you know, pay payments company. Uh, it's gone public. And so, what's in uh, what's in your view? Are, are we going to see an Adgen IPO anytime soon? Uh, is that your long-term goal? We are working off a 10-year plan. So we're doing the things uh, to. I want to say to make Adyen grow in a similar way, but that's almost impossible. We did well over 100% growth last year, but we want to continue this growth path. And uh, for that, uh, you need to work off a 10-year plan. The way how we are financed, it's at currently not something on the agenda. You could look at it at a certain point. Um, uh, from, a, from a team point of view, we're having a lot of fun in what we're doing, so we're not looking at all to uh, start doing something else or. Uh, or wild moves, but it, it could be on the agenda at a certain point to look yeah. at public markets, but not now, because we are rolling out new products, we are entering new markets mm. um, for later, maybe. But would that be, would, would an IPO be the exit strategy for you guys? No, because it doesn't make, uh, uh, this is, we are payment specialists, 
we're working off a 10-year plan and it would be hugely dissatisfying if you couldn't it's like building a racing car but never doing your rounds on track we have so much stuff we haven't done yet that we are uh, uh, we're continuing uh, just take a kind of helicopter view a high level view of the whole whole payment space well, what's what's the big trends you're seeing at the moment everybody feels that the way we pay today will be different but but we're struggling a little bit in what it is um, but the chance that, that in 10 years' time we will still be walking around with a credit card and entering a PIN code, uh, you have the feeling that somehow you're going to use your mobile. So there's a lot of money going into it, and some of it will be very successfully deployed and will be great, have, will have a great return on investment. But because we all feel it's changing, there is relatively a lot of interest in it, and not all of it can land on its feet. Yeah. I mean, we've seen, you mentioned mobile payments, you know, we've seen non-traditional finance players, Apple, Samsung, Google, all jumping in now to, to payments. Um, how do you see, and, and of course Facebook as well, uh, experimenting, Twitter experimenting with how, how to involve kind of e-commerce and payments via their platforms. How do you see that playing out, particularly the social media companies? Are, that, are they, they going to continue with that drive to integrate payments within their platforms? Well, there is a... There has always been in payments this chicken and egg problem. If you want to introduce something new, you don't have the consumer base and you don't have the merchant base, so where do you start? What you see is that companies like uh, Apple Pay, um, that like Apple, that they have used the traditional rail, being Visa, MasterCard, have, um, it runs over traditional, over the, the, the traditional terminal can even take it, if you have an NFC terminal. Um, so that's done in a very smart way because they have the consumer base and the merchants are already enabled. So you solve that. Uh, what is interesting to see is companies who have an enormous amount of consumers already connected to them, like Facebook, how that plays out. Because a few years ago you could never do what they, uh, what they can do. And it's uh, uh, similar for, um, for, the, for the Apple Pays and the Samsung Pay. Uh, will they continue to run on the traditional rail with the traditional card schemes or at a certain point will things move in a total different direction? Uh, uh, that, is, that, that becomes more possible. It was impossible a few years ago yeah. and now suddenly that's on the radar. And again, that's a reason why people are investing a lot of money in this industry because uh, the ship starts shifting, it starts moving. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do, you, do you see these, these, these technology giants as potential competitors to the likes of MasterCard and Visa, which you say, you know, they currently run on those rails. Uh, do, do you see these um, technology players as being able to compete directly with financial players? I think that Visa and MasterCard are very smart in working together with them, mm -hmm. but they shouldn't, and I find it difficult, alienate them from them. Yeah. They shouldn't start fighting with them, and they don't. Uh, because suddenly their hand of cards is a lot stronger than it used to be. So uh, yes, there is a theoretical scenario there. And uh, on the other hand, there, there are people with vested interest who are m avoiding that scenario. Yeah. Um, just moving on as well, uh, fintech was a, was a massive buzzword. It still is a big buzzword. Um, and we saw a lot, of, a lot of VC money go into fintech last year. Um, so, but but we saw, we've seen a lot of companies doing similar things. I've seen a lot of money go into these companies, and I just wonder kind of some of the valuations that these companies are managing to, to get are, are, in my opinion, very, very high. I mean, how do you, how do you see the, the valuation outlook for some of these, these fintech players? Do you think we've, we're in a pretty heated territory at the moment? As usual, some of it will turn out fine, some of it will not. You see every now and then a little bit of uh, naive things going on, things which... Uh, um, have payments always will have its uh, anti-money laundering, it know your customer part. Um, you, uh, um, there are limitations in, in, in how, how quickly things shift. Payments are also slow. Uh, the generation of our parents will probably pay the same way they are paying today until the day they pass away. You're not go it's very difficult to implement new things. So there's, a, there, there's an extreme amount of optimism and I rather operate in a very realistic market than an overly optimistic because overly optimistic might be at a certain point uh, shifting in the other direction. And that is not good for the industry. You want emotion out. You want things to be rational rather than uh, a little bit uh, hyped. I feel it's slightly hyped.
Mm. So, so what does that mean then this year? Are we going to see kind of some of these payment companies, you know, consolidation there or some, some failures? How does that look? Some of them will have difficulties getting funded. Mm. Yes. Uh, and what's, what's the funding environment right now? You know, a few VCs I've spoken to have said, uh, you know, it is going to be tougher and companies are saying, yeah, we found it very difficult to raise money. What's the, what's the problem there? It's easy to raise money for companies which, uh, which have a good outlook on the future. And sometimes uh, companies who didn't have realistically a very good outlook could still have access to money because people just wanted to take the seat at the gambling table. Uh, and that, that whole buzz like, ah, we just need to take a seat at a, at a fintech gambling table, that is gone now. So yeah. oh, great, that's a, that's a nice point to end on, I think. And uh, thanks for taking all the questions. I think we felt like we covered a lot there. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that session too. So thanks for joining us, Peter. Thanks a lot for joining me today. I appreciate it. All right, cheers. Great. Thank you.